morning, and welcome to the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce's next installment in our ESG series entitled The Future of Sustainable Finance. Thank you all for attending. I am John Welch, Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber, and on behalf of the Chamber, we wish you all health and happiness in this beautiful fall. When you look over the evolution of sustainable finance in the last couple of years, it almost feels like we're already living in the future of sustainable finance. Um, green finance or so-called you know, green loans and green bonds have been around for over a decade, um, but we've really seen um, the uh, volumes of financings take off um, you know, towards the end of 2019 um, and then in 2020 and 2021, um, which goes hand in hand with you know, mainstream recognition of ESG issues and of course, um, you know, a deep liquidity on the buy side in, in the markets. But just to, to throw out some numbers to give an idea, um, through 2019 um, or in 2019, there were about 160 billion um, of debt uh, issued uh, under a sustainable title or a green title. Um, in 2020, that number jumped to 700 billion. And in 2021, which is still ongoing as we still continue to live in the future, that number um, was posed to reach a trillion by the end of the year since we already had over half a billion uh, through the, you know, through the, the sorry, 500 billion through the first half of the, of the year. Yeah, there are two types of trends. One is, you know, the private individuals who are saying, you know, I want to put my money really where my heart is and, and people, you know, putting together, uh, you know, sustainable portfolios. And on the other side, you have the pension fund, the big institutional investors who are saying we have a fiduciary duty. And if we are talking fiduciary duty, it means really a, an encompassing um, uh, concept of, uh, you know, that we may need to make sure as very big investors uh, to make sure that we can still achieve big returns in the future. Um, and if the world is not there, if biodiversity goes down, if, if climate change is happening, those, uh, all, all those returns won't be possible. So you see this, uh, the institutional demand very strongly going towards sustainability. And now the third point is that regulations are kicking in and, and forcing, at least in Europe now, is starting to force uh, client advisors to ask their, their private clients whether they have sustainability preferences, right? Before the client advisors could say, well, I don't ask my clients and they don't, maybe they don't care. But actually it turns out that people care more and more about um, you know, sustainability and there will be a surge in demand as a response to this duty to ask the clients. And we expect this to happen everywhere. Singapore is putting together similar uh, uh, regulations and, and I think around the world this will this will have a huge impact on the demand of sustainable finance. Ah, yes, absolutely. I think it's a, a very important topic and it's and like Jan said, it, I don't think it's something that's necessarily new, but it's definitely growing more and more. Speaking of, of Latam specifically, you can see the really the ESG world started in 2014 with a $200 million issuance. That was just 0.2% of the volume overall. And nowadays in Latam, we're at 39 billion and that accounts for about 33% of the volume. So one out of three deals in LATAM are ESG. So clearly it's something uh, investors are focused on, uh, issuers are focused on, and we're focused on um, to improve the transparency of that because it's, it's, it's fundamental to growing the business overall to have that transparency growth uh, from issuers and have that keep going forward. And, and Camilo, from your, from your position from New York that you could see all of Latin America, where, how do you see Brazil fitting into this, um, into this trend? Absolutely. No, and I think Brazil is definitely at the forefront of the, the leaders in, in the ESG space uh, in LATAM. And if you see it from the, the volumes I was mentioning, all time, uh, Brazil accounts for about 40% of the issuances. That's about 17 billion across 32 tranches. Uh, we're including about 17 different issuers in that. Uh, Susano being the largest one with about 25% of the volume definitely at the forefront of innovation, um, you know, green bonds, SLB bonds, environmental KPIs, social KPIs. So the market itself is developing, but I would say Brazil overall is leading the forefront uh, for LATAM in that sense. And that uh, has growing uh, over time where last year we had about 3 billion issuance from uh, Brazil and this year we're almost at 9 billion. So again, the, the, it's growing trend across LATAM and specifically I would say Brazil 
is the one that's most active. Sorry, can I, any industry specifically, or is this across the board? In, in I'd say account? it's across the board. We've, we've seen definitely a couple of pulp and papers, uh, you know, railroads, but I, I don't think it's specific. I think it's clear that corporates in Brazil are aware of how important this is, how material it is, that investors are clearly focused on that, that you need this strategy if you're doing an ESG bond or a vanilla bond. So it's a fundamental aspect of accessing capital markets. So I think uh, Brazilian uh, corporates are you know, advanced on that and it's a trend that's gonna go on. And it's not specific to an industry, but across the board. If we're, if we're talking about a sustainability linked bond, I think the, to be, have a well-received transaction by investors and stakeholders overall, the company really needs to commit uh, to targets that are core material and relevant to their business. And then on top of that, create targets that are ambitious, both against their past performance of that goal and also against the peers that they have and how they're doing on that goal. And then third, if it's something, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, that it's a goal backed by science so that it's benchmarkable and up to the highest standards. I think that's going to be uh, what's going to be the most ambitious or best received by investors. And our work uh, as a bank is helping in, uh, issuers really look for those goals that are material core and relevant and helping them develop those goals so that they're in line with you know, the goals and ambitions of other peers so that they can get to the market. And I think uh, to Marcelo's point, that's the most difficult part, creating those goals because it has to be something you have to establish beforehand. It has to be a goal that is approved really by the company and senior management overall, and then tackle that to put the skin in the game with a sustainably linked bond. Because at the end of the day, it's a commitment you're putting out there. And if you fail to meet it, it's a financial burden, an additional cost to the company. So it's really a KPI that has to be agreed by senior level. So I'd say that's the most challenging part. If we're uh, considering a use of proceeds bond, I think the first step is really making sure that you can uh, allocate an equal amount of the funds you're targeting to raise since the commitment is that you're, that's your commitment to allocate an equal amount. So if you don't have you know, 500 million to allocate to green projects, uh, but you still wanna do an ESG bond, the use of proceeds bond might not be the best and you target the SLB, but in that, you really need to create a KPI that's well received by investors, which again, has to be core material and relevant to the business. And that, again, that's our job. Um, so there's a, a, a large temptation. It's very tempting for companies to try to jump into this space. Um, some of which uh, may not have done sort of the prior legwork that a company like Susano or others have done. Um, and that has, you know, prompted um, you know, some reports in the press, you know, reports, concerns about greenwashing in the sense, you know, uh, uh, people that take a normal bond and try to paint it green, uh, put a little green tint on it and, and try to sell themselves off as, as, as an ESG play. Um, from the investor perspective, um, you know, how do investors think through these issues? How do they protect themselves? Who do they rely on? What do they look at? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, protecting themselves from investments that aren't really green? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. And to some extent, you, you always see the same pattern. I, I think it's, it's not necessarily bad that, that this, this pattern is happening. So, so what, what is, you know, you, you see a new asset class being created, many people jump on it and, and say, look, look um, you know, we issue a green bond as we, as we wish to, to do it and, and maybe in the beginning, there is no real uh, definition. Now, of course, that sometimes raises the question of, of greenwashing, and then somebody steps in. So be it a regulator, be it a reporting agency, be it uh, auditors who are saying, no, we have to do the real thing. And then what, what happens is that these third party assessments come up, uh, right, where, where you, can, you have to certify your green bond with these uh, certifiers which obviously helps, helps a lot the reputation. And then what you also see is that in the indices that follow the green bond market, um, that actually they only take in uh, certified bonds. So again, I think you know, it starts maybe with a, something of, of a Wild West uh, uh, setup, but you know, in time, uh, and it's a journey, right? Everybody learns. And, and we are moving towards, uh, towards a decent, let's say, a decent offering in, in, in sustainable and, and green bonds, which is, uh, which is actually not greenwashing, I would say. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I would say that we're sort of gatekeepers. We, we have a couple, you know, aside from the DCM ESG team, we have environmental teams internally that cross check that and make sure that it's up to the line that risks are, are clearly disclosed. And in the ESG front, there's no red flags, if you will. Uh, but it does come into play, of course, uh, having, you know, different companies across LATAM trying to access the market, uh, maybe uh, prematurely, to your point. And I think uh, what we need to do there is also separate the fact that, you know, there, there's the issuance itself, there's how this is going to be received, if it's an SLD, if it's core, material, and relevant, if it's ambitious. And then separately, the overall picture or ESG strategy and story of the company itself. And I think what we do is help that the story overall, the narrative is strong, that they have, that this isn't just being done, you know, for the publicity, that it's part of the DNA of the company itself to complement the issuance rather than the issuance being in a way for them to be ESG. Really, the company needs to be, have the, the environmental aspects, they need to attack social aspects, they need to have strong and transparent governance. And then with that, they complement their story with an SLB or a use of proceeds bond rather than the other way around. So that's definitely why we do it or how we, we help them guide there. We haven't had uh, per se someone get blocked or you know we, we don't think you can ac access it. I think there's different instruments though for different issuers. In the oil and gas, maybe it's not that relevant for you to do a green bond because overall you're very carbon intensive. So really it's what I would say greenwashing there, but perhaps you know sustainably linked tied to the most relevant uh, aspect of your company, which is carbonization together with the use of proceeds of that bond be green then that would be fine but there are some sort of you know stops that we put internally to make sure that you know that greenwashing doesn't come into play and that the company comes into the market and investors with a strong narrative of their overall ESG story and strategy complemented by the trade they're marketing uh, the uh, correlation between different ratings you get from different agencies in terms of ESG is close to zero. So the same company uh, with the same practices looked at by different raters get completely different results. And the, 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 the reason for that is the lack of standards that we still have when it comes to sustainability. And also uh, the uh, structure that these rating uh, uh, agencies have to assess a complex issue, which is sustainability. So uh, I think the market, in my opinion, relies too much on something that is done with a very low level of quality, in my opinion. Uh, and, uh, and this is okay, it's a maturation process. I think along, uh, you know, over the years, the market will find standards uh, and I think the, the ratings will be more meaningful. But today, for the, if, if I were an investor, I would be very uncomfortable in relying, relying on rating agencies, uh, ESG rating agencies. Uh, and that's why I think the SPOs are so relevant because you know, and, and it's important to have in a, in a, in a particular transaction, uh, a good set of goals that could be measurable, comparable, relevant, uh, because when you try to measure the overall uh, rating of ESG of a single company, there is no, in my opinion, uh, reliable information in the market. Maybe let me jump to the defense of the of those rating uh, agencies just a little bit. Uh, I mean, the, it is clear that that there is still a gap and and the quality issue in, in the data, and I agree with with that, Marcelo. But uh, I mean, to some extent, the the differences between the rating agencies are also due to the fact that they measure sometimes a bit different things, right? Some of the rating agencies just report the materiality of you know, the ESG factors on the company. Other rating agencies look also at sort of the ethical side, others at the impact side. So definitely, and, and then there is on top of that, the question of how do you weight the E and the S, right? What is the exchange rate between the environment and, and the society? So to some extent, um, these ratings are always more an art than science. And, and I think we have to take it to, as, as it is. So this is why we, for example, select the raters which suit us very well, which have the same philosophy as we do. And, and then I think it's, it makes sense, um, but it can be that, that you know, the ratings are, are not the same. 
Which is okay because investment banks do the same, right? They they say buy Citigroup or sell Citigroup or whatever. Uh, so there are different opinions. That's that's perfectly normal, I think. And, and I think maybe just to stick on this topic for a minute, I think you guys have all talked about the lack of standards, right? I think there are several initiatives going on, um, both from a regulatory perspective, um, such as a European taxonomy. There are also um, private organizations or not-for-profits like SASB that are working hard on establishing standards. Um, uh, how far along do you guys see that process? What impact do you see that having? This is an open question for, for any of you. Um, uh, having an impact on sustainable finance in the coming months? Um, I am particularly involved in some of these initiatives, uh, especially the, the one that is led by the UN. Uh, there is a CFO uh, task force in the UN that is doing different things, including uh, helping uh, the, the standardization of some things. And I think, you know, we, we today have different initiatives. I think at some point they will converge. I'm optimistic about that. Uh, everybody has been discussing that a lot, which is the first uh, step here is to, to, to uh, define that is, it's important to standardize. Uh, but the market hasn't found uh, the, 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 the best standard yet. I think it's a process of maturation. Uh, I believe that uh, maybe one year down the road we'll be in a completely different situation. So I'm optimistic about the fact that this has been, is being discussed and uh, something will emerge that will uh, uh, be uh, acceptable and uh, understandable by everyone. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an important motion. We also followed these, um, you know, the discussions from the World Economic Forum, which also brought some of the players um, together. I attended a group there uh, once, and then there is also the SASB, um, the Sustainable um, Reporting, uh, let's say, uh, standard Standards reporting board, yeah. board yeah. which which can certainly also, uh, you know, Im improve things. I mean, what is important, I guess, is to align the base reporting right the, the basis for for the report so the, the different metrics what you do with the metrics right as as a rating agency or is a um, as an asset manager should still be you know subject to competition and 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 liberty to to choose the factors that the asset manager perceives as as material and and I think therefore I, I wouldn't see, that there will be in the end a standard which which will be you know unified across the board and across um, across right the world. Since you guys were at the forefront, I think you've you've uh, spent more time than anyone talking to your investors about um, ESG issues. Um, you know, have you seen an evolution in how they think uh, through these issues? The kind the kinds of questions they ask of you, the level of transparency they want, and, and how, how do you see that uh, moving forward? Well, there's a, an amazing evolution in that front. I think, you know, I, I've been uh, CFO of Susanna for seven years now, and back seven years ago, uh, it, it was very unusual that in, a, in, a, in any investor meeting, ESG would be uh, an important topic. And today we are in the opposite. Uh, situation, you know, there is very few people, very few meetings where uh, ESG is not a topic. So uh, it could be changed completely, and the level of uh, sophistication that we see on the investor side is increasing. We still see, uh, in my view, uh, three uh, levels of um, uh, maturity when it comes to uh, the investors' approach uh, to ESG vis-à-vis uh, -vis the companies. Uh, there is a group of investors that uh, are checking boxes. Uh, they, you know, somebody told them that they have to look at that. So they have uh, their questionnaires and they go checking the boxes, asking questions of the company uh, to make sure that they have the information. This is, I think would be scale one. Scale two, uh, there are investors that are worried about risk management. So they're looking at the ESG practices uh, with the lens of uh, how the company is dealing with potential risks and how uh, what the company is doing today will reduce or increase the risk for the future. And I see that especially in fixed income investors. 
And then there's a third group that look at um, uh, ESG as, uh, uh, you know, uh, as part of the business model of the company, how that would bring opportunities to the company and how, how the company is positioned better or worse positioned uh, in terms of uh, surfing this trend that will certainly be a long-term trend. So we see different kinds of investors and, uh, and that, that um, is also driving a change in the way we interact with those investors. It's very uh, usual today that we bring our sustainability group to meetings with investors. We, we are training the, the sustainability uh, uh, professionals to uh, be able to interact with investors. And also the, the investor relations team, they have to be much better prepared uh, to interact with investors in relation to ESG issues. I think it's, uh, you know, in the same way they, they, that they have to uh, be uh, fluent about the balance sheet of the company, the business model, the results, they have to be fluent to a certain level in ESG and also have the help of the sustainability uh, team uh, when uh, the questions get too, uh, too technical. So this is changing completely. And I think this is very positive. And the more, uh, uh, the deeper the investors go, uh, the better it is for companies that are taking this issue very seriously, which, which is our case. So I think we shouldn't fear uh, that. We should uh, welcome that trend. And this is the way we've been dealing with it. Thank you very much, Juan. Marcelo, Jan, and Camilo for a really excellent discussion. And thank you all for coming. Again, thank you for coming, especially to our members. For those who are not, Please watch the brief video that follows and we invite you to join the chamber. In the meantime, stay healthy and in good spirit.